if you're intrigued by poker, you've probably come across this term GTO, a game theory optimal strategy touted as the ultimate unbeatable playing style. But what exactly is a GTO strategy in poker? What does that actually mean? And how are these strategies generated? What makes them unexploitable? What makes them so good? Do they work against opponents that aren't also playing GTO? And how does GTO actually generate money in poker? We'll cover all this and more in today's video. First of all, what is a game theory optimal strategy? GTO is defined as being unexploitable, meaning your opponents can't take advantage of any mistakes that you're making. It's defined as the best possible strategy against the perfect opponent. So if you can imagine that you're playing against someone who knows how you play your range in every spot on every board and will perfectly adapt to counter any of your mistakes, the best possible strategy against that player is GTO. It's defined as being in a Nash equilibrium, a state of balance. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. At its core, GTO is a defensive strategy designed to minimize your leaks. It's the most robust playing style as it can perform well against maniacs, nits, calling stations, you name it. The goal of any poker strategy is the same, maximize your profit. GTO is just a scientific way to achieve that. To understand GTO, we must first understand the concept of Nash equilibrium. This is a state where no player can do better by unilaterally changing their strategy. Let that definition sink in for a moment. What this means is that if you're playing against GTO players, you have no incentive to play anything but GTO. And if everybody is playing GTO, well, no one has any incentive to change what they're doing. They've already made as much money as they can in the spot, and any change to their strategy would be detrimental. This is where the term balance comes from, and this is why GTO is such a powerful strategy. That's all good and well, but how exactly are GTO strategies generated? Well, we use software called solvers, and solvers are basically just EV maximizing algorithms. That is to say, given a set of strategies, it can calculate how much money each strategy will make. It knows how much money every hand will make in every spot at every decision point. So given all this information, here's our recipe to achieve GTO. First of all, we're gonna start with two players, player A and player B, initially using completely random strategies. Then we're going to fix player A's strategy. By fix, I mean lock it in place, prevent player A from changing. And then we're gonna let player B exploit them or find a higher EV strategy. Next, we're going to fix player B's new strategy and let player A exploit them. And then we're gonna fix player A's new strategy and let player B exploit them. We go back and forth and back and forth, iterating thousands of times until neither player can do any better. We repeat this process until we achieve Nash equilibrium. This is something of an oversimplification. There are other implementations or recipes, if you will, to achieve GTO, but all of them involve pitting EV maximizing algorithms against each other until no one can improve further. This process of repeated exploitation is what makes GTO unexploitable. At some point, neither player can improve their strategy and that point is Nash equilibrium. And so this goes to show that the most exploitative strategy against GTO is GTO. Throughout this video, we've been using terms like equilibrium and exploitative, but before we go further, we really need to break down what that means. An equilibrium strategy is, at its heart, defensive. It's the optimal strategy without information on your opponents, and defined as a Nash equilibrium balanced strategy that minimizes the risk of exploitation. An exploitative strategy, on the other hand, is offensive. It's the optimal strategy with information about your, how your opponents play, and it is imbalanced. This type of strategy can maximize profit by capitalizing on your opponent's mistakes, but it carries a risk of counter-exploitation, meaning it might backfire. Now that you understand how GTO works, we need to address one of the most common myths surrounding this topic. Does it work against non-GTO opponents? This is a very important question because all of your opponents are imbalanced. No human can actually play perfect GTO. So this needs to be able to actually make money against imbalanced opposition. Recall the definition of Nash Equilibrium, a state where no player can do better by unilaterally changing their strategy. If you're playing GTO, your opponent's best response, their optimal counter, their maximum EV strategy against what you're doing is to play GTO themselves. But since they're not doing that, they're imbalanced, they're leaving money on the table. Therefore, by the very definition of Nash Equilibrium, a GTO strategy will always outperform an imbalanced strategy in the long run, heads up. 
To really drive this point home, let's take a look at a heads-up cash game. You will open 2.5x in position. Here's Big Blind's GTO response. All of these hands in red are supposed to be 3 betting, raising to 10 big blinds. But let's imagine for a moment that the big blind is some massive net, and they only ever raise ace-ace. Now this is obviously not a great strategy, but let's imagine that you, in the small blind, don't adapt. You are just playing a fixed GTO strategy. You're going to respond as if they were raising all of those hands they were in the last thing. And you're going to play future streets as if they were had a GTO range. You may be tempted to think to yourself that, hey, wait a second, aren't we going to get destroyed as the small blind GTO player here? Aren't we just going to get completely value owned? And I would say you need to reverse your perspective to understand why this is not the case. Here, I've taken a look at the strategy plus EV of the original GTO strategy. Let's examine Ace-Ace. By raising to 10, it makes 12.9 big blinds. That's the value of 3-betting this hand. Now, question to you. Does Ace-Ace make more money if it's the only hand that's 3-betting? The answer is no, it makes exactly the same amount of money because you haven't changed your strategy. Think about it. This is how much money you can make against GTO. You're still playing GTO, so it can't make more money against you, right? Even if it's the only hand in range, it's still making exactly the same amount. That's the best it can do. What about all of these other hands? What about King King? Well, King King would have made way more money three betting than calling, but in our hypothetical, it's calling. It's leaving money on the table losing about four big blinds. What about ace-king suited? Again, leaving money on the table. This hand would much rather three bet than call. In fact, we can use the compare EV function to get a nice graphic. Here, I'm going to compare the expected value of calling against raising and filter for the raised hands. Everything in red here would rather three bet than call. You can see the call loses money, hence these hands are red, meaning that these hands would rather raise. So queens, for example, would make 8.32 big blinds with a raise, 5.52 as a call. In summary, what this means is that ace-ace is making exactly the same amount of money, no more, despite the fact that you're just treating it like a GTO player, you're not adapting, and every one of these other hands in red is losing money because they're calling instead of 3-betting. So, going back to this, that's why this strategy is obviously not crushing GTO. In fact, it's losing a huge amount of money even against the player that's blindly playing GTO. Now, we can imagine that if small blind is sharp, they'll notice that big blind is a complete knit, and they can further adjust their strategy by obviously folding to a raise. And this, in turn, has the effect of decreasing the expected value of ace significantly, further lowering big blind's value. Obviously, this is not a good strategy. And this is why you shouldn't be afraid of things like, oh, my opponent is doing this and that. There is a minimum EV guarantee in place. That said, against an imbalanced opponent, the optimal strategy with that information is to play exploitatively, to take on some risk in order to punish their mistakes. However, this always carries some risk. It might backfire. You need to know what they're doing and you need to know how to adjust to exploit that. And if you're wrong, if they counter you either accidentally or intentionally, you will lose more money than you stood to gain with the initial exploit. That said, the counter exploit always gains exponentially more than the initial exploit. Speaking as a poker coach, a lot of players who tout themselves as exploitative players, realistically, they only look at, oh, I think my opponent's too value heavy or not value heavy enough. True exploitative analysis is far more complex than studying GTO by like an order of magnitude. It involves heavy use of statistics, it involves mass data analysis, node locking, plugging this in, into solvers, setting incentives. There's a whole science to it that I'm not going to cover in this video. But take it from me that true exploitative analysis goes very deep and most people haven't even scratched the surface. This is where the draw of a balanced strategy comes into play. You don't need any reads with a balanced GTO strategy. You just need to try and play approximate GTO. And this carries a certain minimum EV guarantee. That is to say, regardless of how your opponents are playing, you're guaranteed to make at least this much, if not more. Let's talk a bit more about this minimum EV guarantee. One of the most alluring aspects of playing a GTO strategy is that it guarantees a certain minimum expected value. What this means is that if you're playing GTO, you'll win at least this much money or more in the long run. The best your opponents can do is to play GTO themselves and give you your minimum EV. But if they're not playing GTO, 
and recall no one actually is, then they're making mistakes and your expected value increases. This is the allure of playing a GTO strategy. However, there is a caveat to this. This specifically applies to heads up pots in zero sum games. This guarantee does not exist in multi-way pots. In fact, no strategy is unexploitable in a multi-way pot because two or more people can simultaneously change their strategy. Finally, let's discuss how GTO actually generates profit. This was a subject that was filled with misconceptions up until previous years, and I think it's only recently that people have started to truly understand this topic. You see, there are two types of mistakes in poker, mixing mistakes and pure mistakes. A mixing mistake means that you're taking the appropriate actions, but you're not doing it with the correct frequencies. For example, if a GTO strategy says you should call half the time, fold half the time, but you're always folding, that's a mixing mistake. Conversely, a pure mistake is one that you should not be taking at any frequency. So if the GTO strategy says you should always call this hand, but you're always folding, well, now you're actually losing EV. Take a look at this spot. We're in the big blind facing a third pot seabed from the small blind. Board is queen, jack, five, and we have a gut shot. Now, you can see that the GTO strategy here wants to call 97% of the time, and we can see that it's plus EV. This gains 0.34 big blinds, or 34 big blinds per 100. If we were to fold this hand in this spot, we're leaving 34 big blinds per 100 on the table. This is where the GTO strategy makes money, when the opponents fold hands like 9-8 here and make a pure mistake. However, we can also see that raising 7 or raising 12, turning this hand into a bluff, is playable at a low frequency. About 3% of the time, the GTO strategy wants to raise this hand, and this makes about as much money as calling would. However, if you were to always raise this hand, then your raise might be too bluffy, and that is exploitable. Now, the GTO strategy won't necessarily make money against that. However, an adaptive opponent might notice that you're bluff raising too much and adjust their strategy to exploit you. In summary, a mixing mistake involves using the incorrect frequencies. GTO does not gain against mixing mistakes, and a mixing mistake will only lose value if the opponent exploits it. Conversely, a pure mistake means the taken action that strictly loses EV against your opponent's strategy. GTO gains versus pure mistakes. So the answer to how GTO makes money is that the GTO player gains any time the opponent makes a pure mistake. Game Theory Optimal Poker is a vast topic. I'm going to link several articles in the description of this video if you want to learn more about Nash Equilibrium in poker. We have an extensive blog outlining everything you need to know. If you have any questions or need something clarified, feel free to ask questions in our Discord server or leave a comment on this YouTube video. Anyway, that's all for now. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope you got something out of it. And as always, thanks for watching.